Welcome to our show on the spot, Sonny Liston. We appreciate you coming here for this interview. And as you know, this is the third time we have met before the television cameras. Right. There's once more than me and Patterson there. That's right. And I'm <laughs> glad I didn't meet you under the same circumstances. Sonny, before we actually start talking about Cassius Clay and other questions I have in mind, how about demonstrating before the television viewers uh, some of the physical prowess that you have? Uh, would you put your hand alongside of mine and... Let's see, boy, my, my hand there is lost. Oh. Tell me, when you, uh, when you turn your hand this way, what can you hold without any trouble? I can pick up a basketball. A whole basketball. So a football would be easy or anything along that size. Yeah. What about your reach? Could you demonstrate your reach for us? If you want to, you can stand up. I know you've got a seven-foot reach, supposed to be the longest reach in the history of boxing. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, yeah, I, it is long. I would think Cassius Clay's reach is about the same. Has, has Cassius got a seven-foot reach? Not my, Mine might be a little longer than One that. more thing before we get into Cassius Clay. What about doing this? All the boys like to see you do that. That's all muscle, isn't it? Isn't it? it? <laughs> Cassius, uh, I mean, Sonny, what about the fight with you and Cassius Clay? What's going to happen there? Well, I can say one thing. If they get the tickets for the theater two weeks early and go and sit in the movie, and when the fight started, everybody be going out saying, well, he didn't keep us long, and they've been sitting there two weeks. <laughs> well, just to interpret that right down the cases, uh, it can't end before the first round. There has to be something that happens. <laughs> now, you knocked out uh, Patterson. Two minutes and six seconds the first time you met, and two minutes and ten seconds the second time you met. Do you think that you'll dispose of Cassius Clay before that? Well, a lot of people are talking about he's talking about, he's done all this talking. I think that he's done this talking to himself to try to push himself in the ring with, man. Trying to get up his nerve, huh? <laughs> but would you care to predict, or do you think the fight will go beyond one round? Well, I can say it won't go over three. Won't go over three. What about all this talking that he's doing, these poems he's reciting? And he has one poem where he says he'll beat you in eight. Do those poems and all this talking disturb you in any way? No, the only thing would disturb me is if he'd be around to play around. That's the only thing. Yeah. Is there any real hard feelings between you and Cassius Clay, personally? Well, it isn't any with me. I may, I know that uh, it would be just like a guy coming in to stick you up. There's no hard feeling between you, but you've got something he wants. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's a very witty answer. Uh, so sorry. you couldn't feel mad at the guy. He's probably hard up, but, and you would like to keep what he come after. That's right. Do you think all these antics and poems are going to help stimulate the biggest gate in the history of boxing? Is that one good benefit of all his talking? Well, he's been, uh, been calling them right so far, except one, and uh, everybody thinks that he's got it down pat. He didn't call it right with Doug Jones. No, I mean, at the press conference, he said, uh, he said at first he'll get him in six, then he said, get him in four. He said, six and four is ten. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> That's how he justified the fight going the limit. You once said that Cassius Clay should be arrested for impersonating a fighter, which I know is just a wisecrack of yours. Uh, you still feel that way? Well, at the time, I couldn't say that because, it, you know, any time two heavyweights meet, anything could happen. I mean, but I think I'm the best man, and I think that I'm going to prove to the public that he should be arrested. <laughs> At least I'm going to try. Well, now, in proving that, uh, Sonny, uh, I presume you're going to take this fight as serious as any fight you've ever had. You're going to go into serious training for it? Well, I'm going to take this serious if I was fighting Joe Lewis in his prime. And what are your plans for training? When do you go into heavy training for this fight? Well, two days after Christmas. December the 27th. Uh, do you know where the fight will be held? It sounds like it's going to be held in Las Vegas. Well, I just told Jack Nyland that uh, well, whenever the price is right, it could be at Cassius Clay's house as long as the price is right. You still walk in there with two television cameras and the price is right, huh? 
How much of a gate do you think the fight will actually draw, counting receipts from television, people at ringside, and motion picture rights? Well, that's where a fighter loses a lot of fights. He worry about what the gate's going to draw and not keeping his mind on the fighting. So what's the never draw? That's, I guess I'll get my share. But do you think it'll be the biggest gate money-wise in the history of fighting? That's what the sports writers seem to think and people that are talking about it. Well, I hope so. I would like to see it be. Uh, what do you plan to do after you fight Cassius Clay? Well, I'm aiming to help him out with his palm so he can have a income, you know. <laughs> you want to see that he's taken care of first. <laughs> That's right. But do you have anything in mind after you dispose of that little assignment for yourself, or aren't you looking that far ahead? Well, I take one step at a time. Quits this and no step. It's a half a step, I think. <laughs> this is just a slight gallop. Yeah. Sonny, what about the heavyweight picture in general? Uh, who do you see around that might be a worthy challenger to your crown uh, after you and Clay meet, and assuming that you uh, defeat Clay? Well, I think Terrell is about the third, I think. Who? Terrell. Terrell. I don't know where Matcham's standing now. Mitchum seems to be sliding down, doesn't he? He's sliding someplace. I don't know where it's down or up. <laughs> but uh, is the heavyweight division that devoid of good material where there's just you and Clay and Terrell and that's about well, it? Well, you mean to be saying Clay, you can just say it's me. Just you, that's <laughs> it. You leave Clay out. <laughs> we can forget about everybody else. Huh? How long do you expect to hold the heavyweight title? Well, uh, as long as I can. I want to retire undefeated, so I guess it's like uh, Joe Lewis said, that there's no heavyweights around now to, for me to prove how good I am, and I'd like to s prove it to myself. You mentioned uh, Joe Lewis. Uh, Mrs. Joe Lewis, uh, she's your attorney, is she not? Yes, she is. And uh, how long has she been your attorney? I said she's been my attorney about five months. She's going to handle all the legal affairs for this fight? Yes, she is. Sonny, are there any countries in the world that uh, you'd like to go on an, an exhibition tour, not only to fight the best that they have in those countries, but to see these different cities and countries? I would like to go to Japan, and they say that's the countries that you would like to see. Japan. I know you received a beautiful gift from President Lyndon B. Johnson when he was vice president. Uh, what did he give you, Sonny? He gave me a watch and a pair of cufflinks. How long ago was this? About, about six months. Well, now he is the president of the United States. Do you hope to see him again soon? Well, I'm looking forward to it. What was your impression of the assassination of President John Kennedy? What did you think of that? Well, it hits you just like someone in your family has gotten it. It was really a tragedy. A, you couldn't a, believe it at first. Greatest tragedy this country's known. Yes, it is. Did you ever meet President Kennedy? No, I never did. Uh, getting back to your bout with Cassius Clay, Sonny, uh, how much weight do you plan to lose between now and the time you step in the ring with him? About 15 pounds. 15. You think you'll have any trouble doing that? No, I don't think so. Well, now, what will be your fighting weight when you drop 15 pounds? About 210. And how tall are you? Six one and a half. What's your chest expansion? <laughs> I don't know. Last time it was 48. Could you uh, give us a little half a minute demonstration of inhaling and exhaling and show us your chest expansion? Just like you're going to take a deep breath. Right? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, you have to know how to do that. A lot of, I don't know, I really haven't practiced on expanding my chest. It just comes natural. You don't specialize in that no. somatic purpose. Sonny, what's wrong with boxing today, in your opinion? Well, I think it's... Uh, Getting guys in it don't know anything about it. By guys, you mean fighters or managers? Managers. And you will lay all the ills of boxing on these managers that are not qualified or trained or That's right. not sincerely good managers? 
Well, in what respect uh, is that the foundation of what's wrong with it? Well, I would say a manager, as I tell uh, my manager and my trainer, uh, I tell them when the bell rang, I said, y'all the best duckers in the world. Y'all can stand out there and, and be ducking for me and never get hit. But I'm the only one going to get hit in there. And the manager don't feel it. So if the promoter would give him $1,000, he would take a fight. In which the fighter shouldn't be fighting a fighter like that. Is there anything else wrong with boxing besides uh, poor managers? Well, I don't think it is. I would say it's besides poor management, everything is fine. Sonny, what can be done to cut down deaths in the ring? There was a wave of publicity in the press of this country over the last six or eight months in which uh, that was pointed up that it seemed that in recent years more fighters died in the ring than, than people expected. Well, I would say <clears throat> uh, different, like light heavyweights fighting heavyweights and uh, welterweights, middleweights, they're stepping out of their class because uh, each class gets more money than the lightweights and things like that. And they would do this to get more money. Sonny, we all know that the best fighter is a hungry fighter. Do you think that's one of the things wrong with boxing, that uh, the prosperity of this country is reduced, the opportunity and the desire of many people are forcing to become fighters? Well, I couldn't say, I don't think the fight, like, now if you take my record, I was brought up the right way. When I fought Foley here, I was number two. And uh, he was, he was number two. So they made me fight him and then they put him in my spot. I would just say, for instance, if I lose to Cassius Clay, I should be number one and then fight the number two guy. Then if he beat me, just going back down the steps. There's been a lot of mismatching is what you're saying. Right. Sonny, how long ago was it when you first sensed that you would become the heavyweight champion of the world? In your own mind. Well, when I felt it, when I fought Cleveland Williams in Miami. How long ago was that? About five years. Now, how did that fight and was it a knockout for you? Yes, well. What round? Third round. Third round. Now, what made you think when you were through with that fight five years ago that you were the next champion? Well, the way he could hit and he punched hard. And after the, the fight, we went back in the dressing room and all the reporters came in and said, now we believe you can take it. So there's a, well, did that surprise you? It must have. Did you then say to yourself, well, here I've met one of the heaviest fighters of my time, and I've knocked him out, and that give you the confidence to make you feel you would be the champion of the world? Is that what went through your mind? Yes, it did. And then I looked at his record, and he had a string of knockouts. Before I fought him, I told him, and then I said to myself, I said, oh, these are nothing but setups. And after the first round, and I went back to my corner, and... Uh, I told my trainer, I said, they wouldn't set up. I said, he knocked these guys out. <laughs> so he said, you got to get in close on him. I said, either that, we got to get out of here. <laughs> because this guy is really something. <laughs> so then I moved in close on him, and I won the fight in the third round with the knockout. Who do you consider to be the toughest fighter you've ever met in all the years you've been in the ring? Well, I would say Cleveland Williams and... Uh, I imagine you see the Foley fight. I think Foley's fight was one of my best fights. What was your easiest fight? <laughs> A lot of people think they're all easy, but they're not. They don't know what we have to go through to get in shape to win the fights in the first round. What are some of the things you have to go through? Well, you have to get up 5 o'clock in the morning, run about 5 or 6 miles come back and go to bed and, and get up there and go to the gym, do about 12 or 13 rounds of boxing and training, you know, hitting a heavy bag. A lot of preparation. In your two fights with Floyd Patterson, 
before that bell rang, because the bout didn't even reach the second round, did you feel in your own mind each time you were going to finish him in the first round? Yes, I did. In the second fight, I didn't think so, because I felt that he was going to try to run. Well, did you feel that once you came close enough to connect, that you'd finish him? Yes, I did. Is that because you feel that your punch is so powerful that he can't take it, or is it a combination of the two? Well, I feel that I can... Anybody I hit, I can knock him out. You think Cassius Clay may get on his bicycle with you? I don't think he knows how. <laughs> you don't think he can pedal a bicycle? <laughs> no. You think he's going to try? Well, I, if he gets on his bike, I'm going to get on a motor scooter. <laughs> That's it. You're going to race him, huh? <laughs> Maybe Cassius Clay will be listening to the show. Uh, Sonny, is there anything that annoys you about being the heavyweight champion of the world? Anything that bothers you about it? Well, not in... <laughs> Not anything bothers me yet. Are you happy with the way you're being treated by the press? Yeah, as long as they spell the name right. <laughs> what about the public? You happy with the way the public is treating you and so forth? Yes, I am. Um, I remember Joe Lewis told me he fought uh, some guy in Philadelphia. Then after the fight, he drove down the streets and they throw rotten eggs and rock rocks and things at the car. I said, now, if anybody do that to a champ like he was, you can look for him to do the same for me. So it's somebody always not going to like you. I don't care how great you are. What about a fellow who has in mind entering the ring as a profession, Sonny? What would you tell him? Well, I would say that he has to live by, have to live by the rules and cooperate by them and come out on top. It's all in the knowing how to live. What's the most important thing a fighter should have to be a success? Should he have a fighting heart or a heavy punch? Of course, he needs them both, but if he had only one or the other, which does he need most? Well, it's, it's hard to say about the heart. You know, a lot of fighters got a lot of heart, and uh, I guess you have to have a little skill with it, too. Getting back to that comment you made about managers a few moments ago on this broadcast in which you said uh, a good deal of the fault that lies with the boxing today are poor managers uh, and you indicated some of the managers would just sell the fighter out for a thousand dollars i think you said or whatever the amount is is that uh, more common today than it has been in the last 10 years prior to this well excuse me i couldn't say it because uh, when I was in St. Louis, I had this manager, and uh, Johnny Summerlin, he was from Detroit. And we was driving up to Detroit to fight, so I didn't know who I was going to fight. And so we get almost there, I says, who's fighting the main event? And then he tells me, you are. It's the first you heard of it? Yeah. And then after we get up there and I beat him, he picks up the paper the next day. They want to know what Sumlin offer was. I just that good. It was supposed to have been a, I supposed to have been, a, I guess, a duck for him or something. So and they rematched us. And then I beat him easily the second time because I know what I had to go up against. And then I did the first time. And the fight that I lost, and the only fight that I ever lost was in Detroit. And I still had the same managers. They sent me up on the train and told me they was coming the next day on the plane. So when I get ready to go in the ring, I don't see nobody. I had to go down inside the ring and just get me somebody to go in the corner and take my mouthpiece out. See, and it was a manager that had his heart and a fighter it would be better. Sonny, what do you attribute the tremendous force that you packing your fists? Is it due to good conscientious training and the fact you were born with this power or have you developed that brutal strength right in your fists through some other way? Yeah, I guess uh, two things I picked up from Joe Lewis. Uh, I remember reading a book about him. He says, uh, don't hit at your target. So I always try to hit through it. And when you do that, I'll develop a good left hand from that. 
Don't hit at your target, hit through it. Try to punch through it. Now, uh, what did you do to apply that? How did you adopt that outside of saying that to yourself? Well, I go out and I try to punch through it. <laughs> Just as simple as that. Well, you're able to go right through them. In fact, uh, that seems to be the common practice uh, with you now. Uh, Sonny, uh, when we leave this broadcast, what are you going to do as far as light training is concerned? Well, I do road work and uh, exercise to get my body in shape for the... Who are some of your idols in, in boxing? You certainly must have someone that you'd like to follow or someone that you've honored in your own mind as a great fighter. I would say Joe Lewis. Did you ever see Joe Lewis fight as a champion? Well, I see the uh, movies, not in real life. What's the first heavyweight bout you ever witnessed outside of your own? I don't think it was in there. You never either. saw any. No. You never saw Braddock fight or Schmeling or that's even before your time, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, you never saw anybody fight in the early 50s as a heavyweight champion? Well, uh, here's the Charles. Here's the Charles. And uh, what went through your mind the night you saw him? Did you picture yourself standing there holding the crown someday yourself? Well, no, I never gave it a thought, man. What about Jersey Joe Walcott? Did you ever see him fight? Not in real life. Uh, he was remarkable in one respect. It seems he never had a bruise or a scar or any mark of a fighter. Isn't that true? Yeah, well, I guess that's in his road to back all the time. Sonny, our time is about up. Is there anything you'd like to tell our viewers just before we formally sign off? Well, it's always a great pleasure to come on your program. Thank you, Sonny. It's a double pleasure for me, and I'm really delighted that you let me interview you, and I know this is the third time that we've met, not in the <laughs> ring. Thank you very much, Mr. Sonny Liston, the heavyweight champion of the world, for giving us such frank and straightforward answers. You've lost none of your wit, and beyond that, I'm sure you haven't lost your punch. Good luck to you and your forthcoming bout with Cassius Clay and may the best man win. Thank you. We'll be back after this message. <laughs>